So I was recently featured on TJ, the Amazing Atheist's Drunken Peasants podcast. Basically, Ben and TJ did a segment responding to my video about why I believe feminism is a necessary component of anarchism. And in my opinion, they made quite a lot of crap arguments. So I thought it'd be a good idea to respond and clear up a few things. By the way, if any right-wing people are watching this and wondering if libertarian socialist is an oxymoron, let me just clarify that the terms are being used differently from mainstream political discourse in the United States. In the US, libertarianism is supposed to mean privatization is good, we should rely on market forces as much as possible and basically fuck the poor. And socialism is supposed to mean state ownership and control over core parts of the economy. Uh, and if you use the terms in this way, it's understandable why libertarian socialist would seem like an oxymoron. However, the terms are being used differently here and in a way which is not contradictory. Here, libertarianism is being used to mean a general sense of scepticism towards social hierarchy, and socialism is being used to refer to workers' control over the means of production. So workers run their own workplace rather than bosses or the government. Now when the terms are used in this sense, they're not contradictory. It's not a contradiction to be skeptical of social hierarchy and through this skepticism say that we ought to get rid of the bosses and run the workplace ourselves. You might be inclined to ask, well, why don't you just call yourself something else to save the confusion? And the simple answer to that is, well, we were first. And we don't see why we should have to change our terminology after it's been co-opted and hijacked by right-wing yuppies finding new ways to shamelessly defend unbridled corporate power. With that aside, on with my response to TJ. A lot of what he says is just sort of flippant remarks that don't really mean anything, so I'm just going to respond to his central points. From what I've seen, most of the people who describe themselves as MRAs or anti-feminists or anything, any other fucking, just non-feminists in general are not sitting there like we hate feminism or we disagree with feminism or we're not feminists because, you know, we're against women's reproductive and sexual rights. Well, of course they're not just going to fucking say that, are they? Open bigotry is, for the most part, socially unacceptable. So it's really naive of you to think that just because they don't necessarily overtly say that they're opposed to women's reproductive and sexual rights, then there must be nothing to worry about in this regard. It's like believing somebody who says, I'm not a racist, but... Secondly, there are plenty of examples of misogyny within anti-feminist circles. Stefan Molyneux claimed that women need to be held accountable for who they have sex with. Girl Rights Walk claimed that she didn't find anything seriously ethically questionable in an article which claimed that, quote, women should be terrorized by their men. It's the only thing that makes them behave better than chimps. Polly Lam uh, claimed that women who go to bars and have a few drinks are practically begging to be raped. These are all popular figures, not fringe characters, within the MRM. Paul Elam founded the Voice for Men website, and Molyneux and Girl Writes What both spoke at the AVFM conference in July 2014. And they're all coming out with horrible, toxic, demonstrably anti-women rhetoric. But never mind that. There's nothing to worry about, right? What about the positions that we actually attack feminism for? Like, you know, such as Anita Sarkeesian's video game critiques. Oh god, video game critiques. How awful. The general point of Anita Sarkeesian's video game critiques is that gamer culture tends to be quite heavily male-dominated, but it doesn't need to be, and that it's possible and desirable for the gaming community to be a more diverse, inclusive, and welcoming space for women. I don't see how that's morally objectionable. Or the language policing. This isn't something that I've experienced. In fact, there are feminists that have explicitly argued against language policing. Uh, in the description, you'll find uh, the uses of anger by Audre Lorde and a geek feminism article about tone policing as a couple of examples. Or the guilty until proven innocent shit when it comes to rape claims. Retroactive rape claims. If you're a rape victim, it's extremely difficult to present evidence to support your case, given the nature of the situation. As a result, rape victims often feel completely powerless to do anything about it, and fearful of it happening again, because often the perpetrator is someone that the victim knows. Uh, now this scenario is far more common and likely uh, to happen than a false rape accusation, and therefore it's more humane to assume that the victim is 
telling the truth. As I've said in my previous videos, anarchism holds that social hierarchy, that is to say a form of organisation where people are ranked one above another in terms of status and authority, does not justify itself. Unless a justification can be given, particularly by those what? who exercise... Unless... Since when does anarchy have an unless to that clause? If you'd let me finish my sentence, I was going to say that hierarchy is not self-justifying and that unless a justification can be given, then it is illegitimate and should be dismantled. And this concept of anarchism is one which has been given by anarcho-syndicalist Noam Chomsky. In an interview, he said that anarchism is a tendency which aims, quote, to seek out and identify structures of authority, hierarchy and domination in every aspect of life and to challenge them. Unless the justification for them can be given, they are illegitimate and should be dismantled to increase the scope of human freedom. Chomsky's political ideas stem from anarchist thinkers such as Rudolf Rocker, Mikhail Bakunin and Peter Kropotkin, whom he frequently cites in his writings about anarchism. The unless part simply means that there are situations in which authority can meet its burden of proof, although they're not very common. An example Chomsky gives is if you're a parent and the child runs into a busy road, in that situation it's justified to use authority and even physical coercion to get the child out of the road because doing so saves the child's life. In other words, you're strawmanning anarchists when you imply that they believe that all authority is wrong in all circumstances, when in reality they simply reject authority which fails to meet its burden of proof. 99% of these people who go around calling themselves anarchists are fucking, like, not. You hear that, Noam Chomsky? You are not an anarchist. TJ, the amazing atheist, is here to tell us what anarchism is all about, because he clearly knows his shit. Every anarchist has to have a line of bullshit, I find, to justify why their crazy worldview that doesn't make any sense does make sense. No, TJ, you just don't want to listen to what anarchists actually have to say, because it's much more comforting to believe that the institutions of education and the media that you've presumably trusted your whole life are fundamentally correct in their portrayal of radical politics. It's much more comforting to believe that than to learn that you've been lied to your whole life. And bear in mind, of course, that the form of authority that anarchists are particularly critical of is distinct from authority that's based on knowledge, competence, and reason. So, for example, it's so distinct is, from he's really saying he's really uh, in favor of meritocracy, not anarchy. No, anarchists have always made this distinction. Uh, Russian anarchist thinker Mikhail Bakunin, in his essay called What is Authority, says, quote, Does it follow that I reject all authority? Far from me such a thought. In the matter of boots, I refer to the authority of the bootmaker. He goes on to say, quote, I bow before the authority of special men because it is imposed on me by my own reason. I am conscious of my own inability to grasp, in all its detail and positive development, any very large portion of human knowledge. Anarchists are not opposed to referring to someone else because they're more competent and knowledgeable than you about a given subject. So you're talking out of your arse here. Now, let's hear what you seem to think patriarchy is. If I go outside and, like, snap my fingers and tell a woman to do something, she's like, well, you are a man. I'd better obey you. Patriarchy says so. Because it's the patriarchy that does that. What an obtuse misrepresentation. Oh, if there's patriarchy, then I should be able to just snap my fingers and get women to follow my instructions. I can't do that, therefore there's no patriarchy. Patriarchy does not mean that absolutely any man could just walk up to any woman and get her to follow his instructions. Uh, most feminists do not make that claim. In fact, Sylvia Walby in Theorizing Patriarchy explicitly states, quote, I shall define patriarchy as a system of social structures and practices through which men dominate, oppress and exploit women. The use of the term social structure is important here, since it clearly implies rejection both of biological determinism and the notion that every individual man is in a dominant position and every woman in a subordinate one. The claim is that there are norms and customs in our society which elevate the status of men and lower the status of women. Governments, police and courts tend to be mostly male-dominated institutions. The evidence is in the description. And the dominance of men in more powerful institutions in society uh, is not as a result of biology or some law of nature, but as a result of culture and socialization. 
There are studies which show that women are perceived to speak more in group conversations than they actually do, which seems to suggest that we're not as used to women uh, speaking up and voicing their opinion uh, as we are with men. Uh, there was also a study which found that uh, people interpreted the emotions of a baby differently depending on whether they were told the baby was a boy or a girl, even though everybody was looking at the same video. The claim that's being made is that men and women are socialised differently and in such a way that leads to male dominance in society, not this gross oversimplification that you've given. Given that hierarchies based on something as arbitrary as gender are clearly illegitimate, anarchists must advocate gender equality. However, let's just suppose, for the sake of argument, that feminism, I equalism love, and masculinism... I love anarchists with like a lot of rules. First of all, anarchists are not opposed to rules or agreements about what modes of conduct are and aren't acceptable. We merely oppose the idea that the power to make and violently enforce rules should be concentrated in the hands of a very small minority of people. This doesn't mean that we can't collectively make our own rules ourselves and in a democratic way and enforce them ourselves either non-violently or violently if necessary. Secondly, this isn't about rules anyway, it's about logical consistency. You can't be both an authoritarian and an anti-authoritarian at the same time, just like you can't be an atheist and a theist at the same time. Saying, I am critical of social hierarchy, and yet I don't want to dismantle any arbitrary form of hierarchy based on gender, uh, is like saying I'm an atheist but I believe in Thor. It's just a logical contradiction. And there's no reason why scepticism towards social hierarchy necessarily means that you have to reject logical consistency. Saying that anarchists should advocate gender equality in order to be logically consistent does not violate any anarchist principles at all. That's always my favorite. Yeah, that's a key component to anarchy. Lots of rules. <laughs> you know, very formalized structure of anarchy. Oh, for fuck's sake, this is another straw man. Uh, anarchists do not oppose formal organization. We just advocate particularly democratic formal organization. Uh, anarchist thinker Mikhail Bakunin uh, states that society should be organized from low to high and from circumference to center by means of free federation. So this means that the economy, for example, instead of being set up to enrich a very small minority of people at the expense of everybody else, would be run through worker self-management. Uh, now what does that mean? Well, uh, as a rough outline of what this entails, basically uh, in each workplace you would have it be controlled by a workers' council, which operates on principles of direct democracy. And the workers' councils across each stage of a given industry uh, would federate by means of delegation to form a syndicate. And the syndicates in each uh, industry in a given area would federate together, again by means of delegation, uh, to form a regional economic federation. And no, I'm not just pulling this out of my arse as something that might be nice to have one day. This has been applied in practice historically by anarchist movements and worked, such as during the Spanish Revolution, which was led primarily by the CNT, uh, which was a large-scale uprising involving millions of workers. So it's not just a small-scale commune in the woods. So yeah, anarchists support formal organisation, because it's the only way that you can meet human needs on a mass scale, and because it's the only way that you can build a mass working-class movement. Anybody who tells you that anarchists are against organisation is talking out of their arse. Do you know what the theoretical magazine of the Anarchist Federation of the UK and Ireland is called? Organise, with an exclamation mark. His basic breakdown is, you know, uh... There should be a hierarchy, but it should be based on merit. Nope, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that because people naturally develop different sets of skills and abilities, it's inevitable that people will refer to the authority of others if they are more competent and knowledgeable on a given subject. This is not the same as saying that there should be a fixed hierarchy based on who knows the most. In Bakunin's What is Authority essay that I mentioned earlier, he explains that competent authority does not entail a fixed structure, but rather a continual exchange of mutual temporary authority. He also goes on to say that we shouldn't give any hierarchical privileges to people who are particularly knowledgeable because you'd likely mistake charlatans for geniuses and because power corrupts you'd uh, end up turning geniuses into charlatans by giving them uh, societal privilege and ultimately you would establish masters over society. So no, I'm not saying that there should be a hierarchy based on who knows the most and anarchists in general are not saying that. Uh, all we're saying is that because people develop different sets of skills and interests, uh, when it comes to knowledge, you refer to different authorities in different situations. And that's fine. 
there are subcultures in America that have patriarchies, but to say that America overall is a patriarchy, that doesn't really strike me as true when there's no laws that say women can't vote. How, how did women get the right to vote again? Oh, it's, I just can't remember. There's no laws that say women can't hold elected office. There's no laws that say that women are to be closed out of particular jobs. You keep referring to laws. Why do you assume that if oppression is not being legally sanctioned by the state, then there's no oppression? Um, it's illegal, but women are still being raped. They're still being harassed regularly on the street, and they're still afraid to go out at night wearing whatever they want. Um, it's not necessarily a legal requirement for men to harass and rape women, but it's still happening. In fact, there are examples where the state does sanction the oppression of women. Uh, for example, uh, laws restricting women's rights to choose uh, whether to have an abortion. Uh, Ohio State Rep John Adams supported a law uh, which would basically mean that women would have to get consent from their male partners uh, if they wanted to have an abortion. Now obviously this is ignoring the fact that there are uh, transgender people and lesbian couples and so on. Thankfully that wasn't passed, but given the increasing power of the Christian right in America, I think it's likely that we'll see more anti-women, anti-abortion legislation being passed in the future. And you yourself have admitted that there is a clusterfuck of bureaucratic procedures that women have to go through just to make a decision about their own bodies. I think that that's state-sanctioned depression. And what he's saying right now is, oh, well, men aren't qualified to talk about feminism. Rich people aren't qualified to talk about wealth inequality. You know, you don't get to decide who's qualified. You have to actually look at opinions based on their own merit. The problem is that privileged people are perceived as being impartial and objective, whereas disadvantaged people are perceived as being biased and irrational. Uh, for example, there was this male feminist lecturer who turned up at a university uh, to give a lecture about feminism. And members of the audience were saying, oh, finally, an objective opinion. And he said, well, what do you mean by an objective opinion? And they said, well, uh, all of the other lecturers that we've had talking about feminism have been women. So in this situation, it's the man is perceived as being an objective opinion, whereas the woman is perceived as not being an objective opinion. It's to do with challenging that kind of perception. You can't be for the rights of one or the other. If you're truly for equality, you have to be for the rights of both. TG what a madman! I regret saying that. I don't know what I was thinking when I when I said Take it back. I don't know what I was thinking when I said gender equality would have to examine the rights of both sexes. I was being a fool. I was Clearly only women are disadvantaged ever. Only women are systemically disadvantaged and achieving gender equality requires alleviating the systemic disadvantage of women in the same way that uh, alleviating the economic oppression of the working class requires unionizing to improve pay and conditions and eventually empowering workers to run their own workplaces. It's not a difficult concept to understand. To say that we should give men and women an equal degree of attention in order to achieve gender equality is to assume that neither men nor women are systemically disadvantaged, which is not the case and has not been the case historically. Assuming that women are not systemically disadvantaged is to reduce sexism to individualized scenarios rather than to analyze it structurally. And in the way of social movements, structural analysis, not individualism, is what gets things done. Explain to me the power that I have that my maleness bestows upon me. Like, what, can, what, what powers and abilities do I have as a male that if I were female would just simply not be accessible to me whatsoever. Okay, you have the freedom to walk down the street at night wearing whatever you want without fear of being harassed and assaulted. Uh, you're likely to have higher income than the average woman. You have greater employment opportunities. It's easier for you to enter political office. Uh, you can turn on the television and see your gender being widely represented. Uh, you aren't 
constantly bombarded with unattainable beauty standards, at least not nearly to the same extent as women. Um, if you drive poorly, it won't be attributed to your gender. Uh, people won't question your judgment because it's the time of the month. Um, although you're an atheist, so this doesn't particularly apply here, uh, most major religions will propagate the idea that men ought to be in a position of authority over women and so on. I can go on, but you get the point. And just because these inequalities are not always being legally sanctioned by the state, that doesn't mean that they're not a problem. You seem to have this mindset where everything has to be an absolute. So if you're an anarchist, it must mean that you reject all forms of authority, in all circumstances, even competent authority. Uh, you're opposed to all rules, uh, and you're not even allowed to say that people should be logically consistent because that's authoritarian for some reason, and you're opposed to formal organization. And then you turn around and say, oh look, that's such a crazy worldview that doesn't make any sense, why would anyone believe that? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, when in reality, the anarchist position isn't nearly as black and white as you're making it out to be. It's the same for feminism. You seem to think that if you're a feminist, that must mean that you think all men are in a dominant position and all women are in a subordinate one. Men are never at any kind of disadvantage ever and absolutely any man can walk up to absolutely any woman and tell her to do something and she'll just do it. Uh, oh look, this clearly isn't the case, uh, therefore there's no patriarchy. Why on earth would anybody be a feminist? When again, the feminist position, at least for most feminists anyway, isn't as black and white as that. You also seem to argue that oppression begins and ends with the law. And so if there are no laws which say women should be subordinate, then there's nothing to worry about. To me, this is completely false. It's perfectly plausible for women to be uh, oppressed or stifled as a result of cultural factors and social norms and pressures from the media, which aren't necessarily dictated into being by law. And it's reductionist to suggest otherwise. When it comes to your misrepresentation of anarchism, I think that comes down to ignorance, and I don't think that that's your fault. I can't blame you for not knowing anything about an obscure political ideology that has to be kept out of the limelight while everybody else debates within a very narrow spectrum of opinion between neoliberalism and social democracy. When it comes to feminism, you strike me as being more dishonest, uh, because feminism, although still not being very well represented, it is more well known than anarchism. You've exposed yourself to it more, and you've had plenty of opportunities to learn about what feminists actually believe, and yet you continue to make these misrepresentations that aren't reflective of the actual feminist position. If you'd like, I'd be happy to debate with you about anarchism if you're up for it and you're willing to learn about it. I'm not up for debating with you about feminism because although I agree with the general line of argument, I don't know a great deal about it. Um, and so I wouldn't be the best person to defend it. However, if you're willing to debate with me about anarchism, then I'm up for that. So that concludes my video response to The Amazing Atheist slash The Drunken Peasants. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, for more anarchist content, subscribe to Libertarian Socialist Rants and Anarchist Collective. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.